That was easy. Um, <laughs> Joan Morris, South Clay Mop, from the Songhees, called upon me to quiet the crowd and to introduce her. So thank you. I didn't have to do much. <laughs> Please welcome Joan. Good evening. Um, Joan, thank you. That was a good reminder of uh, uh, what uh, privilege I have uh, being on of the Lacombe and Songhees, not of the, of the Saanich people, to be here and to uh, raise a family here, to work here and more. So thank you. That was a good reminder that uh, we have this privilege, but not a lot of us. Um, uh, ever met, and so it's a good reminder of what we may do in our personal and professional lives to earn it. So 
thank you for that reminder. My name is Chris Garamont. I am the science director for Rain Coast Conservation Foundation. Um, I'm also the Hakai Rain Coast professor of geography here at UVic. Kind of like the opening act here tonight, the opening <laughs> band. Uh, very shortly, I'm going to pass it over to my friend and colleague, Doug Niesloss. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to pass you over to Alicia and Ilona of the Society of Geography Students. So please uh, warmly welcome these two members. Rainforest wolf uh, that I first got to know 
in Helsinki territory, in what we now call, also call, the central coast of British Columbia. And part of that was just listening to people, older people, people like Chester Starr and Ed Martin, that told me things, knowledge that was embedded in stories, primarily, about uh, how people cannot really be disentangled from place or, or decoupled from the animals there. So if I were to learn about these animals, I should also learn about these people. And these people had grace and authority. They also had people sort of a generation or two behind them, these sort of warriors, gentle warriors, that, that kind of in a way enforced that the rules that the old timers laid down. And I had better listen to them. This is William Housty, he's about 6'6", six, six, a gentle giant, um, but uh, one of my, my uh, mentors and colleagues in Helsinki territory. So these lessons about people and the animals that I was there to study and some of the lessons I learned about how these animals are not just animals something other, these are the beings that are considered ancestors and relatives. Things like this is grizzly bear tracks, this is a wolf that figured prominently at a summer camp that I've been volunteering at for, for many years. This is, of course, a deer, skull, and antler. This is an eagle, eagle down headdress. So I wanted to start with that sort of context uh, to tonight. Uh, we're going to talk, of course, about this wonderful place that especially people from city centers love to think about as a sort of pristine, untouched wilderness. The reality is, this, this wilderness has been um, lived in and lived off of for, for many thousands of years. Uh, we now know it as the central coast of, of British Columbia, but at, and at one time, and maybe not everyone knows this, but it once supposed to be the highest density human population uh, that didn't practice sort of modern day agriculture. But of course, they also practice both agriculture and aquaculture in this incredibly productive landscape. So we now notice the Great Bear, we should absolutely celebrate it also, for they are fantastic animals, these great bears, these grizzly bears. This is also an area that's so special that black bears come in white. That when we talk about wolves of the sea, there are two different alternative thing we might be speaking about. This is a place that, in which trails like this outnumber by an order of magnitude or length, say in kilometers, the amount of roads in the system. Now think about that. These are trails not made by someone in a hard hat and chainsaw and park signs everywhere. These are trails made by uh, no doubt people. Uh, and, and animals with which they share that landscape, in fact, whole ball in that landscape together. And at one time, of course, trails like this would have, if you were sort of fit enough and ambitious enough, you might be able to walk trails like this from the coastal temperate rainforest of southeast Alaska all the way down to northern Mexico along that sort of moister coastal fringe. But of course, you can't do that anymore. But you can still do it in much of, of the area we'll be speaking about tonight. Many of those trails were made for and kind of lead to this spawning salmon. And although uh, salmon have kind of taken a hit since uh, people who look like me showed up, um, it's still uh, a stronghold in, in North America for spawning salmon. I really want to acknowledge and, and thank Ray Coast for supporting me and my work and the way that we've chosen to go about our work uh, in this landscape, uh, doing our best to be uh, community-minded and community-engaged and doing sort of applied work 
where we can see uh, it getting outcomes that benefit both people there and the animals in the landscape that I might have been obsessed about and probably still am um, so many years ago. Brainpost really helped us figure out this sort of problem. This is what I call the standard model of conservation science by academics, people that are trained like me with PhDs, etc. So there's kind of three steps to this model. So the step one, you, you do research, ideally really rigorous research, target the highest ranking journals in the world, you publish your findings of conservation significance. Step two, so you kind of hope <laughs> something's going to happen that, that in our case, maybe the province or the federal government will, will change the way things are for the better. You want to know what step three is? Yeah, you're returning to step one, because that's kind of all there is, really. So I really want to thank Ray Coast and, and colleagues like Doug and another level of government, an order of government, uh, in my view, a level of government with the uh, moral authority and increasingly the legal authority, even under sort of our legal systems, the colonial legal system, to manage local resources again. This is sort of a way that we can align our values and our knowledge as conservation biologists with the ways in which the world is increasingly working again towards a much better way of managing resources, a way that has been done for, for thousands of years. So it does give me hope. I want to tell you a little bit about Draco's for those of you who don't know. Uh, we're advocates, absolutely we are. We don't consider uh, that pejorative. Uh, if uh, those that disagree with us refer to us as advocates. We're informed advocates. We don't believe in, in shrill advocacy. We draw on science to have available evidence in many cases that comes from our own work. Um, so step one is investigate so the science that we do here. Give you some examples. That didn't work very well here. Give you some examples on a global scale that has very much relevance to what we're talking about tonight. Here's some work we did with Tom Rankin, who's here tonight, a friend of Rain Coast, Caroline Fox, a Rain Coast postdoc, and Heather Bryan, a Rain Coaster, since her undergraduate days, now a Hakai postdoc. Uh, so reporting in, in the journal Science, we uh, evaluated, assessed the role of what we call human super predators, us and our, we reported on our disproportionate take of terrestrial mammals and especially marine fishes. So don't worry about the details of this graph. For those of you that like details, this is the probability of seeing an exploitation rate that high or higher. So the bottom line is fisheries, especially commercial industrialized fisheries, take way more than the shark share, way more than the marine mammal share way more adult fish prey than larger predatory fishes. We are the super predator in the ocean. On land, our take of herbivores is about the same as other carnivores, but where things really get messed up, where things get really get um, deviant and unique is our role as predators on other predators. That is our role as predators and hunters of carnivores. So here's some statistics from the paper. Human super predators, we kill adult carnivores at about four times the rate at which we kill herbivores. And for the mathematicians in the audience, you might figure out that's relatively easy to do because carnivores exist at such low population densities, it's actually really easy to draw down predator populations, and that's exactly what's happening. That's why we're losing so many of these carnivores from the face of the planet. That's why, in fact, we've lost grizzly bears from much of British Columbia. I'm going to show you on that very shortly on that. We kill carnivores like grizzly bears, like Cecil the lion and others, at about nine times the rate at which carnivores kill one another, because they do do that, but they do it at a very low rate. So I share this with you because we revealed and illustrated to as many people who would listen 
the reality is that these animals don't have the evolutionary history, the adaptations to deal with this sort of mortality, this sort of killing by a super predator like us. So this is sort of a global paper, a broad scale meta-analysis, but very much so is it relevant to tonight's conversation and the grizzly bear trophy hunt in BC. One quick matter of business uh, about grizzly bears. I've been seeing online that some people, um, I guess the, the correct word is accuse, or suggest that Rain Coast is somehow anti-hunting, that we're against uh, British Columbians, let's say, putting food on their table via hunting. We are not, absolutely not. We do distinguish the very big difference that about 90% of British Columbians share with us, and that is the difference between hunting for food and hunting inedible animals like grizzly bear for sport and trophy. Those two things are very different activities. Here's some science very relevant to tonight's conversation. This is work led by Rain Coast PhD student uh, Kyle Artell. As many of you have probably heard on the news or read, there's lots of controversy about how well the provincial government might or might not be managing this very controversial hunt. It's been speculated for two decades now that their management style is, shall we say, uh, dangerous and, and far from cautious. So what we did after securing the data, which took about five years, and a freedom of information request that went all the way to the Supreme Court of British Columbia to get the data from the province that we're keen on sharing the data with us as researchers, we found some troubling uh, realities. Uh, here we're seeing a map of British Columbia, and these are what are called grizzly bear population units, sort of roughly ecologically different um, subgroups of these animals. And here are color codes that we've assigned them based on their ability, the province's ability, to keep mortality, the number of bear deaths below their own very highest threshold. A threshold above which even their own numbers suggest that grizzly bears will start to decline. And so first I want to point out that we've lost grizzly bears from big chunks of the province in black. We are losing them or they are blinking out in gray and dark gray areas close to hunting because it's really hard to find bears there anymore or recently extirpated. We've lost another one right here, or right here recently. In green, the province, according to their own science, has done a, a decent job keeping mortality below those thresholds. In the yellow, they've blown it once over a three-year allocation period. In orange, they've blown it twice and not found, not discovered their errors over six different years. And in red, some of these pockets of the province, they have repeatedly allowed mortality above their own threshold and not done anything about it. Now this is really troubling to us because the second part of this paper, we analyzed how they set those thresholds and whether or not they bothered to incorporate uh, what we call uncertainty as scientists. How many bears there are out there? How fast they can replenish their population when they're drawn down by these super predators, these trophy hunters? How much killing goes on that the government can't record, this unreported poaching, illegal kills, etc. So incorporating all that uncertainty, the map basically bleeds red, which is really, really troubling. So troubling, in fact, that we got published in the journal Science, a letter that essentially uh, illustrates that a government, and this is probably more widespread than we know or, or think to know, a government that commonly refers to the, the management of wildlife or fisheries as science-based likely is not if they can get away with a performance like this. Here's a kind of investigate that we really like. This is field research um, on the bears in the area, grizzly bears, black bears, spirit bears. This is our work uh, with our partners, who I'm going to introduce shortly, over 22,000 square kilometers, the size of El Salvador. At each spot here, you're seeing what uh, we call a non-invasive hair snagging station where bears come and leave us a little present from which we learn a lot of information. 
So the coolest part about this project, other than the science, is that these questions are driven by our community partners, partners like Doug of the Kids in Hey Hey, uh, Weakening Nation out of Rivers Inlet, uh, Weakening Village New Hulk out of Bella Coola, the Help Sick out of uh, Bella Bella. This is what it looks like on the ground. This is, I don't know, maybe a eight, ten-year-old kind of mid-size, getting big, bare, kind of about the size of a smart car already, coming in, and he's gently going over a barbed wire fence. And in doing so, he's leaving a little bit of his fur. This is in the spring, so he's got all of last year's hair with him, and it's just falling out naturally. And he's coming to investigate this scent pile. This is a bait that we set for him. It's a non-reward bait. He can't eat it, so he doesn't stick around to defend it or really change his behavior. This guy puts on quite a show. The grizzlies, and, and for some reason the blacks don't, uh, the grizzlies like to rub in it. Uh, so he's gone on average in about two minutes, two minutes, five seconds on average. Uh, these animals uh, skedaddle and go about their, their lives. But what they've done is leave us a whole bunch of information. Using genetic tools, we can tell what species of bear this is or what species period, because we do get wolves and deer and wolverine, et cetera, through these stations. Um, we can tell which, what sex it is. Is it a male? Is it a female? We can even tell what individual bear it is. Have we caught this bear before or not? We can do a bunch of fancy lab work that tells us the uh, hormone profiles of this bear. If it was a female, was it uh, lactating recently? If it's a male and a female, actually, how high is its testosterone levels, a signal of the competitive environment? How high is the co uh, uh, cortisol levels, the measure of stress? All of which we can relate back to how much salmon that bear ate the previous year, which we are informed by by something called stable isotope analysis from those same pairs. So we know an awful lot about these bears without even necessarily seeing them. We're seeing them through remote camera here only. So the ecology is wonderful, but it's really how this project works socially and politically that's, that's really inspiring. So we have in, in New Hulk territory, Heather working with Megan, uh, in Helsic, Kyle working with William, uh, in a week and you, Jennifer working with, with Megan, and as you hear about very shortly, uh, Christina working with Doug in Kittisun Hay Hay Territory. This really is kind of a, the lifeblood, blood, the, the, the central organizational model to how we aspire and do to the best of our ability our work in a very community engaged uh, process. So, uh, the Rain Coast is very lucky to have found partners in the Hakai Institute to create what we believe to be the first university laboratory of its kind that does work like this, that does work on the behalf of, of environmental organizations. So investigation is very important. Science alone is never going to change the world. Uh, so as a broader portfolio, we aim to inform decision makers. I'm not sure if you've seen this cartoon, you're only seeing half. Uh, so this is Enbridge sailing over the federal approval uh, process, of course. Even though we were a part of that, we were uh, so-called expert witnesses and formal interveners before the National Energy Board. Uh, they're about to smack into the judicial reviews that Rain Coast and others have launched. Uh, Doug's Nation also on a mountain of, of paperwork and expense in front of them. But really what's going to stop them, of course, is, is that. And that's going to work, but just in case, kind of behind uh, <laughs> I wanted to, I wasn't so sure. Hmm. Here's something a little more relevant to tonight, and, and this is kind of the, the marriage of some of the science and making it apply here. So, so Doug, uh, we've known Doug for, for actually a long time now, but Doug uh, came to us specifically on this bear file about three or four years ago, and asked us to help him and his people document um, what he was observing 
Um, so we threw up some remote cameras and some genetic work, and we also asked people in his village uh, and the neighboring Pelsex and Bella Bella about the distribution of grizzly bears. Formerly, they were on the mainland, as far as we know and as far as people know. Um, and of course, our modern day science tools can't tell us about the past. Only people could and their knowledge, their local knowledge. As Doug will explain shortly, this is the line at which the province separates where grizzly bears are, and in their mind, grizzly bears are not, according to the province. So that's what it looked like not too long ago, pre-92. In the decade after that, the percent of participants reporting uh, grizzly bears on the islands goes up somewhere around 50 to 30 to 50 percent. And these days, you can't go to an island without bumping into a grizzly bear. A really striking ecological change in this landscape. And as Doug will explain, the movement of grizzly bears to these islands is really important because if Doug has his way, and Doug will have his way, as you will find out, uh, those grizzly bears will bring real protection in terms of forest habitat to those islands. Doug will tell that story. You can investigate, you can inform decision makers, but it's also really important to engage with the public and we, you know, keeping with the illiterate uh, uh, situation here, triple eyes, we like to inspire at Rain Coast. One major way we do this is when we do our science, not stop at the publication stage, at, at, at publishing in peer reviewed journals. We like to engage the media so they help us tell the story. In doing so, we can help shape the narrative about what society thinks, feels, believes, etc. Because, because community members, urban people, everyone likes and trusts science. So we find it, we feel it's our duty to help uh, uh, tell our stories, tell our science stories. And then we can kind of just sit back on issues like this and other people tell the story for us. And collectively, the work by people like Doug and, and other community members and, and that storytelling in science leads to data, sociological poll data like this that the province can't ignore for much longer. Doug will talk about that soon. And when informed advocacy isn't enough, what Ray Coast does, which is very inspiring to me, is kind of just uh, takes matters into their own hands. So these are guide outfitting territories. When someone from outside the province wants to come and kill a grizzly bear, or a wolf, or even a mountain goat, um, they have to come and hire some of these people, uh, whose last names are here, to guide them as professional guides. And they end up killing about 50% of the grizzly bears on the coast, and probably many more of the wolves on the coast. And this had always troubled us, and as campaigners at Rain Coast, we fought against this for 10 or 15 years. But in 2003, as some may know, we took the matters into our own hands, raised uh, the money to do so, and bought out the first territory, the, which granted Rain Coast the exclusive rights to guide clients. And I can tell you that we still guide clients and are looking for bears. But we are really terrible guides in terms of uh, hunting. Some people even bring guns and really ham it up. Uh, but they shoot bears with cameras. And they shoot those bears again and again and again with a camera. And in doing so, we crank down the killing level of grizzly bears by about half in a massive area, now about 30,000 square kilometers on the coast, about half of, of the so-called Great Bear Range. So I think I'm done. I want to spend one minute or so introducing uh, my friend and, and colleague Doug. I mean, you can't get a business card big enough to fit all of Doug's jobs on it. Uh, I can tell you that he, uh, he carries uh, much weight of responsibility uh, around with him. Uh, he's a, a student of uh, his old people, of his old timers in this community, and uh, that is reflected in the way he governs as the chief counselor of his nation. Uh, I also really want to uh, 
uh, acknowledge and thank Doug for uh, giving Christina service, the same kind of um, uh, opportunities for sort of a rich uh, learning experience about how to be an applied scientist working uh, with a government like yours. So I want to thank and acknowledge you for that, Doug. And I'd like to ask every one of you to uh, warmly welcome Doug Beesloss.
foresters, we're not into mining, um, but we still need to generate revenue. And as you know, in these remote areas, I and mean, where I live in Plumtu, there's no road access. Uh, you can only get there by boat or plane. Uh, so for us, we needed to start looking at other ways of generating some revenue, um, you know, in the community. So we really tried to look at uh, a bunch of different options of, of what we can do. So that's when I started. Uh, I started back in 2000. I was about uh, 18 years old when I was hired to start trying to develop uh, an ecotourism operation in my community. Uh, and that was a fairly new concept in my community. We didn't really know what to expect from ecotourism. And I remember the very first few meetings that we had, we, you know, we had questions like, are we going to have all these tourists come into our community and buy out all the food in our band store? Are they going to buy out all our fuel at the fuel station? Are we selling our culture? Um, you know, those are some major questions that we had to answer. Um, but the community also started to recognize that we needed to diversify our economy. We couldn't depend on resource extraction as a source of business anymore, and we need to, to look at these new opportunities. Um, so that's when I was brought on. Uh, Evan, who's here tonight, he hired me way back when I was about 17 or 18, and uh, we started to build this tourism business together. Um, and when we first started, you know, it was uh, we looked at a lot of different avenues of, of what tourism could be in the community, and we thought cultural tourism was the way to go. Uh, we thought, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of cultural sites in the in the territory. Uh, we have everything from you know some old totem poles uh, to old big houses. Um, so we thought that was the way to go and really try to market that. But we found out very quickly that there just wasn't a huge market for it. Some people were very interested in it. Um, and uh, <coughs> so, some, you know, so we, we had to focus on diversifying that a bit more. So we got involved in kayaking instead of doing kayak tours. Uh, we did that for five years, kayaking on the territory. And uh, we found out very quickly that kayakers are the cheapest people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> They bring their own kayaks, they bring their own food, and uh, sometimes you'll be doing these tours to break even. So uh, we really want to start diversifying that even a bit more. So we started doing other things like doing tours for small pocket cruisers that were going through the territory. Um, but just like our tourism wasn't quite there yet, so we needed to invest in the infrastructure. And when we were start up, you know, trying to start up our business, we just didn't have the resources. But through some of the Great Bear Rainforest agreements, we were able to bring some additional revenue um, and allow us to start looking at expanding our operations. And that's something that really the wholesale market really wanted to do. And back in those days, we had our company was actually called Plenty Tourism back in those days, and we really wanted to shift our brand, and people were really interested in bears. So that's what we really wanted to focus on, is how to start getting people to this region around bears. And uh, it was, uh, so one of the things we started to do is we wanted to look at investing in a lodge. So we started to, number one, I guess, we brand our operation to Spirit Bear Lodge. We built ourselves a, a nice hotel, um, and that can accommodate uh, 24 people now today. And just really focus on growing this business and, and, and start to train a lot of the community members, uh, you know, whether that was uh, training new guides, training new board operators, training new uh, hotel staff or cooks in the community. Um, and it's been extremely positive. And today, uh, well, I guess as of last year, we just broke a million dollar mark. Uh, we employ about 45 people in the community. Um, and now it's the second biggest industry in our community. Um, so it's really grown a lot, and, and it's taken a bit longer than we hoped, but it's now at the point where it's uh, you know, starting to generate some good numbers for the community and create some, some local employment. So uh, you know, we're quite happy about that. So, so one of the things, you know, obviously people from all around the world um, are really excited about coming, having the opportunity to view bears. And we get people from all over the place that have come from all these different countries and some people say, well, we just don't have wildlife anymore. We used to have grizzly bears, we used to have all this different wildlife, but they've lost it all, whether that's through deforestation or through, you know, just loss of habitat uh, and things like that. So I think for us, the Great Bear Rainforest is one of the last strongholds uh, for bears. You know, it's one of the only areas you get these large, intact, uh, temperate rainforests, uh, you know, on the planet. So. Um, and there's certainly, uh, I don't want to say a ton of bears in the area, but there's certainly more than a lot of other places, and we're quite uh, lucky to have these. Um, and we spend quite a bit of time with these bears. I mean, this bear in particular, we spent uh, when he, we spent time with him. We first met him when he first, was first born as a yearling cub, um, and this is his third year. The mother just pushed him away, and uh, this little cub just followed us everywhere he we went, like we his mother. So we really got to know these bears. And some of these bears, you know, we're quite lucky that we get to spend uh, in some cases, I've watched some bears for 12 or 15 years and, and watched them grow and, and 
as cubs and until they have their own cubs and sometimes two or three sets of cubs. So we get to know some of these bears pretty, uh, pretty well. Um, we also have another bear in the area, uh, which is a subspecies of black bear. This is the Cody species uh, of black bear, um, which is quite neat because a lot of these, in, in these areas, uh, we have these black bears could potentially produce spirit bears, and both parents have to have this recessive gene um, that produces a spirit bear. Uh, and these bears have been genetically isolated to the islands. Um, that's allowed this, uh, this spirit bear to thrive there, uh, you know, a lot of these areas. So, um, and then, of course, the spirit bear um, is a very special bear in our community, uh, both culturally uh, and, and for economic purposes as well. I mean, uh, the, the, in the Central Coast, uh, we have the highest concentration of spirit bears in our territory. Um, and it's really the only place in the world that you're going to find spirit bears is right here in British Columbia. Um, so, and we just, uh, we've seen a lot of challenges over the years, uh, whether that's through uh, trophy hunting or whether that's through deforestation. Um, and this moves them more and more uh, of their habitat. And just a bit about, you know, me and my culture, I guess kind of started out with tourism. I remember when I was first hired in uh, 2000, um, Evan, who's here tonight, actually uh, told me to go out and look for a spear bear, because I used to work for a fisheries program before I worked for tourism, but he sent me off to go look for a spear bear, and I just, I never even heard of a spear bear, um, you know, before, actually when I was hired on the job. Um, so I went to go look, and I just thought, there's no way there's this, this white bear walking out of the territory. So I had no idea what he was talking about. So I went up to go and look for this bear, and I thought, I kind of, you know, didn't think it existed. Um, and anyways, uh, as I was out there, uh, this white bear basically walks right in front of me and lays down, and he's eating this fish. And, uh, you know, the forest opens up, and the sun comes out, and, and there's blood all over his face. And it was just this really magical moment and I just you know and I was shocked like how come I you know my elders had never talked about spirit bears so I went back to the community and was asking them how come you know we've never heard of this and, and a lot of them just didn't want to talk about this because during times of the fur trade they didn't want to uh, bring any attention to it they were worried that people would hunt out these bears and uh, so it was a really special animal uh, in my community and then they started to tell stories about the spirit bear and in my community we have a legend of the spirit bear and in our culture uh, Gu Wei, who is the raven, uh, he's the creator of the world, and he also created the Ice Age. And as the ice started to melt, uh, he wanted something uh, to remind himself of the Ice Age, so he decided to turn every tenth black bear white and set them on Princess Royal Island, and that area would be protected for the spirit bears. And so it was a really special animal, and the elders just didn't want to see it, uh, you know, hunted in, in any way, and, and so they tried to do whatever they can to protect it. So, so that was really interesting to you know to learn about as we started. And of course, people come for a lot of different, you know, a lot of other things as well. We have a million bald eagles. I know a lot of Americans, especially, get really excited when they see bald eagles in the territory. Um, Central Coast or the great wolves uh, are certainly very special as well. And sometimes we see packs up to 20 wolves in the territory. Um, so these are quite unique animals. And sometimes you can watch them fish. Uh, you know, and that's certainly uh, something that people are learning more about now. Is how much. Uh, Salmon, uh, you know, these are actually, well, there's only place that I guess these wolves eat salmon, so we're just going to um, And obviously we try and incorporate as much as we can in terms of, uh, you know, cultural tourism, really getting the community involved. And my community said our business is not just about money. Our business is about uh, the community. It's making sure that we respect the environment, make sure that we minimize our impacts out there, and make sure that the community is involved and that they're learning their, their stories, they're learning their culture, they're learning their territory. So that was really important that we were able to develop this and implement this amongst the community. Uh, we also have an increasing whale population. Um, as you know, a lot of the uh, humpback whales or killer whales, a lot of them were all hunted out, but through some protection, well, there's been uh, an increase in the whale population, uh, which has been great over the last few years. So that's been uh, growing in the territory. <coughs> so as we started to develop this tourism business, uh, we started to run into a number of challenges as we were trying to, to build this business. Um, trophy hunting was a major issue. Um, uh, lack of enforcement from provincial agencies, uh, ecosystem-based management, and I'll get into some detail on some of these things. But I just had the opportunity to travel around to all these different forums and try and promote tourism, and whether that's through wholesale markets or uh, work a lot of different groups and travel trade shows and, and go all over the place. And I see very much that the province goes out and promotes bears, and it's all over their uh, campaign ads, whether it's uh, and they market this as supernatural British Columbia. And, uh, you know, they, they have one of the most iconic animals, and then the spirit bear, they use as one of their logos and, and protection. Um, 
and I think there's just a lot of things that people don't know that happen right here in their backyard. Um, and one of the major issues that we start to see uh, is trophy hunting. Is, uh, this is a major issue. So as we're out there trying to build our tourism business, uh, you could be in, a, in an area competing with trophy hunters. Um, and so that was a major issue. So we, there's basically two uh, hunts that happen. There's one in the spring and there's another one in the fall. And some of them are open for about a, a month to two months where these guys, can, people from overseas can come in and come and blast all these bears. And uh, there's been several times throughout my career that I've uh, witnessed some of these things. And I remember the very first time was actually back in uh, 2005. Um, I remember I spent about five or six weeks with this one black bear. And this black bear was living in an area where there was uh, mostly grizzly bears. And, and normally these, these bears don't do so well uh, if there's uh, grizzly bears in the area. So this black bear knew this. And every time we went there as a group, this black bear would get really excited to see us. And he would just grab this fish and he would be excited like a dog. And he would just kind of come over and eat his fish right in front of us. And we just had some amazing viewing. And he hung around us all day because he knew that the big male grizzly bears wouldn't come close to us. So he would lay down and just eat his fish. And, and we just had some amazing viewing. Um, and I remember one day we were pulling out. Uh, uh, we were pulling out of that area, and as we were pulling out, um, we passed a, a boat. It was a punt, and it was an open boat. And uh, these guys were all dressed in camo gear. They had tripods on the boat. And uh, I thought for a minute, you know, trophy hunters. And I thought there's no way these guys are trophy hunters um, because I just didn't think they would be up in my area on the Central Coast on an open boat and not far away. So I just I kind of dis disregarded it. And we left. We ended our day. I went back to our community. Uh, and a few hours later, um, our Coastal Guardian Watchman program came in shortly after behind me and said uh, there was a trophy hunter that was in muscle and he just went in and shot those bears. He went in and shot that black bear and he shot that grizzly bear. And then he broke into our cabin and he had these two dead bears laid out in front of our cabin. And I was pee right off uh, that I heard about this. Um, and then I tried to get access so someone can lend me the boat so I can get up there, but nobody really wanted to give me the boat because I think they probably knew what, I, what, what happened. Um, but I was furious, and I went back to my uh, band council the next day, and, and I was just, you know, I was pretty young back in those days, and I went back to the band council and said, well, how the hell do we allow this in our territory, you know, as First Nations governments? Uh, you know, how do we still allow this practice to happen? We go out there and promote tourism in this pristine wilderness, and then we still allow these kind of activities to happen in our backyard, and I said, something's got to change. Um, and then that's really what I meant. Raincoast, we started to work with Raincoast a lot more, and I heard that they were making some efforts to purchase out, uh, purchase this particular license that this guy had, which was a huge territory. Um, so I knew I really wanted to get involved and, and, and help uh, support that, and, and as one of the ways of ending uh, trophy hunting in the Great Bear Rainforest. So, um, and that's when we started working a bit more. Um, so that was just one of the issues around trophy hunting. Um, another one of the issues is resident hunting. So as British Columbian residents, uh, people can come into our territory and they can buy a black bear tag for $20. Uh, you can buy a, a grizzly bear tag for $80. Uh, then you can come out there and shoot these bears. Um, and for us, that's really concerning because we have black bears in our territory which people can come and hunt and that bear could be carrying that recessive gene that produces a spirit bear. Uh, so for us, that could really limit spirit bears which already there's fairly low numbers already. I hear guesstimates that there's 400 of these bear bears out there, uh, but between Clump 2 and Hartney Bay, I would say we don't see more than 50 of these bears, and we cover almost every river. We cover well over 100 rivers in our territory, uh, just in Clump 2 area, and we don't see anything close to 400. Um, so, but another issue is uh, through resident hunters, they can come in and shoot grizzly bears, and I know uh, resident hunters promote themselves as conservation organizations and say that, uh, you know, it's a sustenance hunt. Uh, they come here and they hunt uh, for sustenance purposes, and we respect that as First Nations people. That's what a culture is based on, to say that if you're gonna hunt, you should use everything. You should eat everything. Uh, but here's a guy who came up in our territories, and this was actually documented by one of our Coastal Garden Watchman program. This guy came up uh, with the intent, saying that he was a resident hunter, and he came and shot this grizzly bear, and he uh, shot it and chopped off his head and chopped off his paws, and then he left the rest of it there to rock. And uh, he just took the, the head for a, uh, a trophy. Um, and uh, yeah, just, it was uh, really unfortunate. So we, uh, you know, I guess you know, with the watchman from Bella Bella documented all of this stuff. 
And uh, the guy who shot it was actually an NHL hockey player. That was the Clayton Stoner incident that happened uh, a few years ago. Um, and it was pretty crazy because we actually went to that place where we hunted this bear just before Clayton Stoner had dropped there, hung up this massive sign that said, no trophy hunting in the Great Bear. And uh, this guy walked right by our sign and shot this bear. And uh, again, trying to say uh, he was a resident hunter. Um, in this case, it was illegal. He didn't have proper tags because number one, he wasn't a really <coughs> resident anymore because he moved down to the U.S. and played for the Minnesota Wild and now uh, the Mighty Ducks. Um, but that's something that we deal with on a regular basis, that trophy hunters can still come in and shoot these kind of bears. So that's another major issue that we still deal with in the Great Bear Rainforest. Uh, deforestation is still a major issue. And I know that there's been some work around uh, developing what some people call ecosystem-based management. And that's supposed to be logging a lot different, so no more clear cuts um, and, and really getting away from kind of conventional type of logging. So no more road systems, trying to look at heli logging a bit more. Um, but everyone has a different interpretation of what ecosystem-based management is. If you go talk to the provincial government, their difference, uh, you know, their opinion of EBM is very different than the forest companies. If you talk to the forest companies, it's very different from First Nations. Um, so when I started to do a bit of work around this, I started to find out while well, visual quality corridors, for instance, are not really being considered as a part of the ecosystem-based management. So uh, you know, you can get huge ball spots in mountains, and it just to me uh, defeats the purpose of of promoting this you know, amazing wilderness that we have. So that's something that we're trying to look at doing is addressing these kind of issues and making sure that we're keeping those areas intact. Um, and I still think you can do forestry. I still think you can do sustainable forestry, but just changing the landscape. And so we told our community that, you know, because we also uh, have a forest company that we would lead the way in terms of what ecosystem-based management is going to look like in our territory. So, uh, but we want to make sure that things like bear habitat is protected, marbled mirrorlet habitat, tailed frogs, northern goshawk, all of those things, all these big animals, and these are some of these are on the endangered list now. So we've got to make sure and address and, and protect uh, these areas and make sure that they have a place. Um, and obviously, salmon habitat, salmon, salmon habitat is really important. And all the work that we do, we want to make sure that we look at this holistic view of management. And uh, if there's no salmon, there's no bears, and that's very clear. That you know, the elders always tell me about this, and because I do a lot of bear work, and the elders always say, "Doug, you can't talk about bears." unless you're talking about salmon, so please get to work on salmon. So um, <laughs> next year, that's our project, we're getting into salmon research. <clears throat> but I always remember when I first started in tourism back in uh, 2000, and I remember going into this one river, um, there was an amazing system called Coots Inlet, and I remember in this, I was in this system uh, with one of my elders, and, uh, and as I got in there, we started to go up the river, and in the middle of the river, it was just all black, full of salmon in the middle. And I remember saying, holy, you know, what, what, you know, there's a ton of fish here. And, uh, and I was just amazed at how many fish were in there. And this elder grabs me and he straightens me out and he said, Doug, this is a fraction of what it used to be. He said, when I was here back in my day, in my younger days, he said, you could walk across their backs. The salmon was so thick that you can get across the other side of the river. And he said, so this is a fraction of what it used to be. He said, if you come in this system, you know, a long time ago, he said, there was hundreds of eagles, tons of bears, tons of wolves. And he said, that system, this is completely changed and completely different from um, what it was in my time. And so from that day, from 2000 until now, I've seen huge decline in that area. And I just see a fraction of what it used to be in my time from 2000 until now. So I can't even imagine what my elder has seen in his lifetime. Um, but a lot of time we get, you know, DFO scientists that come in and say, well, yeah, it's pretty good. The numbers are fairly healthy. But if you go look at the historical numbers for some of these areas, Places like Coots Inlet used to have about 80,000 fish in those areas, and now some of those systems are down to about five or 6,000 fish. So I think shifting baselines are something that we need to look at, need to address, and somehow we need to deal with, because some of these systems just haven't been able to recover. And through all of our interviews with our community members, they'll be able to tell you exactly the day that they've seen that change. They'll say, that we remember the day that DFO opened up these areas and fished up these areas right to the mouth of the river, and those areas haven't been able to recover. So they can tell you exactly what day, what month, uh, you know, when those things happen. So these are the sort of things that, you know, these are just a few of the things. I can go on and on forever on a million different issues. Um, but again, I think just a lot of things that people don't realize that, you know, these are some of the issues that go on uh, right in our backyard. So this is, um, I was supposed to have a video. Unfortunately, I couldn't get it to work. Um, as I, have a new, I have a new laptop and, and we just switched over. So anyways, I couldn't get it, but I've been trying to tackle a lot of the issue around uh, trophy hunting in the Great Bear Rainforest. And I remember in 2010, 
um, I came down to Vancouver to actually promote our tourism business. So I, I was still a tour guide back then. And I came down to promote our tourism business. And during the opening of the Olympics, I don't know how many of you guys remember, they actually had this big bear mm -hmm. in the middle of the mm -hmm. opening ceremony. Mm -hmm. And I think it was supposed to be a polar bear, but some people, must, you know, must, you know, I guess, thought it was a spirit bear. And I was like, okay, I'll take it as a spirit. That's fine. <laughs> so, I'll wear it as a spirit bear. But so some people were asking me about spirit bears, and I had the opportunity to talk about bears, and I had mentioned something about bear hunting in the media. And then one, one newspaper picked it up, and another one, and it just tripped, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And soon I was doing like 50 interviews a day, it was just crazy, it got out of control. I was doing everything from Chinese TV to Turkish TV, it was, it was, it was going all over. But um, So the issue of trophy hunting really started to blow up, and I remember I was in the Vancouver Art Gallery, and I was there doing a big display about spirit bears and, and their habitat location and all those kind of things. And then, um, so some, a whole bunch of people in media came to me and interviewed me about um, the bear hunt issue. And after I gave my answer, I said, yeah, bear hunting is a real thing and it happens in the great bear and these guys come and shoot at the sport. And then, and then so right after they finished doing an interview with me, they ran upstairs and then Barry Penner was upstairs and he was the Minister of Environment and that's what the, that's what the hunt used to be managed under was the Minister, uh, was the Minister of Environment. And at that time, the minister said, well, listen, trophy hunting is based on sound science. He said it's based on um, economics that, uh, well, no, first of all, they said it's based on sound science and they have the best available science out there. They said it's based on economics, that trophy hunting is worth $350 million to the province of British Columbia. And they also said that the provincial government has increased all these protected areas on the British Columbia coast that are supposed to protect these bears. And I knew they were full of it. I knew none of those were true. But I'm not a scientist and I couldn't go and prove all those things, so we had to go and tackle this issue and try and create a group that would go and tackle and debunk these issues because we just knew they were false. So we set up a group uh, on behalf of Coastal First Nations called the Central Coast Bear Working Group. Uh, through a lot of partnerships, we were able to go and, uh, and gather the resources and start tackling these issues. And the issue when they say uh, that all these protected areas are supposed to protect bears uh, in the Great Bear Rainforest, <coughs> There's only one conservancy in the Great Bear Rainforest that protect bears, and that's the Coots Mateen. Uh, essentially, there's some sort of form, or there's some form of bear hunting in all the areas, whether you can hunt black bears, uh, a lot of areas open up for grizzly bears. Uh, so that was absolutely crazy that they, you know, say that these protected areas protect bears. So you can walk into any park or conservancy and go blast a bear in the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, and then they also said it was based on sound science. So we said, well, where's the, what are they talking about sound science? My time over there, uh, last 16 years, uh, as a tour guide, um, as a field technician with um, co-management, I've never seen a government scientist out there doing bear research. Uh, not once in uh, all of my travels have I ever come across uh, and seen any, any work out there. So I asked them, well, what's sound science? So that's through the partnerships with Raincoast, we were able to look at that and say, well, what are they talking about with sound science? We found out very quickly that it was actually someone down here in Victoria looking at these computer habitat models and saying, well, here's so many trees there are, here's so many berry bushes, therefore this many bears that should be. And, uh, you know, they do flyovers of, of one or two systems in British Columbia and apply that, you know, through all, all British Columbia and say this is, um, this is what the bear population is. Which is absolutely crazy and there's lots of gaps in the science. So from something really basic like decline in salmon, if you don't have the salmon there, you're going to have a huge cost to the bear population. And I've seen this uh, several times throughout my career as a, as a guide. I've seen salmon just wiped out in some systems and you just watch all the bears just move on to other systems. Um, so I've seen it in, in my time. Um, so we said that wasn't enough. We had, as coastal communities, if the government wants to use science as an argument, well, we'll go battle science with science. We'll start doing science in our communities. So uh, that, through a partnership with Rain Coast, has allowed us to do that and to have people like Christina Service come up to our communities and bring that expertise and, and get out there and start doing that science up there. And we have governments on the ground. So in the Central Coast, collectively, we spend about half a million dollars on bear research every year, um, just collecting all that data. We have hair snags in well over 100 rivers in our territory. Um, and, and we partner this with all the other communities. So we're able to share all of our data and collect all the, the, bears, the bear research. And then the last one, they said bear, uh, that trophy hunting was worth $350 million to the province of British Columbia. And we said, well, wait a minute, can you guys tell us what bears are worth in the Great Bear Rainforest? And they always go in the media and say, bears are worth, I know, they said, hunt, trophy hunting is worth $350 million for the province of British Columbia. So we said, just tell us what bears are worth. They wouldn't do it. So they just would never do that. So in all the response in the media, they always talk about trophy hunting, which includes all animals, from rabbits to moose to, you know, whatever, you know, 
So we said, fine, we got to go find out what those numbers are. So we partnered with one group called Crest, and we also partnered with Stanford University. And we said, we you guys come up here and do an economic analysis? And tell us really what's going on up there. We're not having any influence. Here are the issues. And so they want to uh, go look at, at some of the issues. And they said, well, Doug, we can't just look at, oh, we asked them to look at trophy hunting versus ecotourism operations or tourism on the coast. And they said, well, we have to include resident hunting as well. And we said, fine, so go, you know, go and do that. And, and so they went out and they, uh, here are the results. They basically said there's four, there's four guide outfitter companies in the Great Bear Rainforest that come up to our territory to shoot bears. They employ a total of 11 people. And uh, both the trophy hunt and the resident hunt combined is worth $1.1 million. Um, and they said there's 56 ecotourism opera uh, operations, um, 56 ecotourism operations in the Great Bear Rainforest uh, that employ a total of 560 people. Um, and that was worth $15.2 million. The report also said that um, the provincial government actually spent more money <coughs> managing the hunt than they actually made on the hunt. So this whole economic argument to say that trophy hunting was a huge part of British Columbia's economy just didn't make any sense. So we blew all those numbers out of the water. They didn't have the sound science. These protected areas don't protect bears. So uh, essentially, we're trying to create all these arguments to be able to end some of these issues. And I just don't think that science is there. And another really interesting thing is you know, the population estimates that, that are thrown out there to say that there's um, 17,000 grizzly bears, 30-something thousand black bears. Uh, we just don't know where they're getting those numbers. You know, I just don't think there's anything close to those kind of numbers. And through our bear research, we were able to track huge movements uh, of bears. Some bears would come uh, from my territory, you know, uh, talk end of our territory, go all the way down to Bella Bella and come all the way back again. So there's huge movements of these bears. So uh, I just don't think there's as many as, uh, as you know, the estimates are staying there. Um, and here's another issue on habitat protection. I know Chris kind of touched a bit on this as well. Um, but I remember I was sitting in my office one day and uh, the provincial government sent uh, you know, these, these habitat maps. So all these maps came across my desk that basically had, you know, the, the provincial government said this is all grizzly bear habitat and that was all on the island and they had some areas they identified on the island. And as you know, the provincial government has a responsibility to look at protecting grizzly bear habitat, both level one and level two. Level one is supposed to protect 100% of the habitat and level two is supposed to protect 50% of the habitat. And after we went over all the data, we found that there was huge gaps in the data. And there was one river in particular, I remember this one, they said, this is the same river, really small system. Half of the river is protected as level one, and the other half of the river is protected as level two. I'm like, this is the same freaking river. Bears sleep on both sides, so it didn't make any sense to me. How does this make any sense? So, and then another thing is the province didn't have any data for grizzly bears on all these islands. So I made a phone call and I said, hey, Tony, there's lots of grizzly bears on the islands. You guys are missing huge chunks of data on the islands. And this is the response I got from the province was that, um, well, you know, what, well, they, no, first of all, they said, there's, um, those are probably just male bears, male grizzly bears probably just passing through. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, I've been watching these bears for the last maybe six or seven years in the territory. These are mothers with cubs, you know. And they said, well, what evidence do you have of this? And I said, oh, I got videos, I got GPS, I got photos. I said, what do you want? I'll send it all over. And they <laughs> said, you know, well, Doug, you know, there's some people that mix up grizzly bears and black bears. And like, That's what I do for a living. Like, you can tell the difference between a black bear and a grizzly bear. So I was shocked. And then the next answer was that, you know, Doug, you're not a scientist or a biologist, and you can't be making these sort of allegations. And I just, I was crushed to think that, here I am as a tour guide, I can see these things, I know they're there, I can smell the bears, I know exactly what's there, but you know, just been no credibility in that arena to say that these bears are there, which is absolutely crazy. So um, we said, well, what do we got to do to start proving that these bears are there? And that's why, you know, to me that discussion wasn't going anywhere. So that's through the relationships with Raincoats that allowed us to get up there and collect all this fur, do all that analysis. <coughs> And now we've been doing this for five years, we're on the fifth year now, um, and uh, you know we have a ton of data. And we have proved that there is tons of grizzly bears on all these islands, and we're able to go back to the province and say, well, listen, there are grizzly bears there. We have remote cameras and you know, a lot of these systems. Uh, you know, We have the barbed wire that's collecting the fur. We're doing all the DNA analysis, genetics, uh, you know, through here in Victoria, I just learned this through UVic. Um, and that was huge, so to be able to bring that. But those are just some of the, the, the challenges that we have in terms of you know, trying to do that. 
But through this work and through the partnership now has really allowed us to go back to the table and say, well, listen, let's go back and have a, a different discussion about uh, identifying bear habitat. And to them, let's not forget the islands and have all those islands. So that's been really important as well. Um, and just one of the other major issues is just there's not a, there's a, a very little monitoring enforcement from the province when it comes to a lot of these issues. I don't know that when we developed our land use plan back in the day, um, and, and you know, I would say probably 15, 20 years ago, we used to see, we used to see a lot of illegal activities happen in our territory. Uh, we used to see a lot of people come in, and, and it was a lot of poaching of bears. People used to come in, whether it was taking gallbladders. Um, and I remember one time we found a dead bear up in one of our rivers floating in the river, and his paws were gone, his gallbladder was gone, and his head was gone. So, um, and I remember, uh, you know, so the, the community said, as we started to build these plans, that, Doug, we need to have a presence up there. You know, we can't just talk about building land use plans, marine use plans, we can't talk about developing conservancy <coughs> management plans. None of this means anything if you don't if you don't have monitoring and enforcement. So that's really important. So go and find some way of getting a presence up there because my community said you just don't see BC parks up there. You don't see DFO up there, so get up there and do something about it. So that's when we started to build our watchman program. This is our, our watchman program which is men and women from our communities that are hired to get up there and monitor and patrol our territory. So I just want to show you this is 2014. Um, and it's a bit blurry, but basically you can see this, this line is, um, you, you get a bit, you know, they come out 10 days in 2014, and that's probably the most we've seen probably in the last 15 years. So 10 days of the whole season, the whole, whole year, uh, they get out there and monitor patrol areas. Um, so our, our Washington program, when we created this program, we spent about $150,000 on our program every year, and our guys out there every day. So we put a GPS tracker on the boat, and it tracks every movement of all of our coastal red and Washington to get out there and monitor and patrol these areas. Um, and that was really important. So the illegal poaching has really fallen off the map. So we just don't see that in our community anymore. And we've also banned trophy hunting in the Great Bear Rainforest. So it's an alliance of all of our communities. We said, we don't care what the provincial regulations are around trophy hunting, it's banned. If you want to come here to hunt, it's not going to happen. So we try to get that message out there loud and clear uh, to trophy hunters, to the provincial government, that trophy hunting is not going to happen. And we'll do whatever it takes to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, and so, again, we're continuing to enforce that. We're continuing to work very hard, um, whether it's taking all the best available science and all the information we have, taking that to the government to government tables to make sure that we can end um, you know, practices like trophy hunting. Uh, and then next, the resident hunt, which feels a little bit of issue that we get a time. But, you know, a really important thing for us is we want to make sure that um, we were collecting the research, and that was a huge part. And, um, this was really challenging in our community because my community didn't really trust a lot of science, and uh, especially some of our elders, because in their time, science was always used against the community. And they watched people come in and over harvest and take everything out of the territory. Um, still, like today, you will not get, we're not allowed to touch abalone. That's something that was a once abundant resource, but uh, after it went to commercial operations, uh, it's been wiped out. And that was all based on sound science, and you can take a certain percentage without affecting the overall population, but now they've been impacted so much that they just haven't been able to come back. So trying to get, especially some of my elders in my community, to say that you know we have to go fight science with science has is, is, is been very challenging, but now they're starting to see the value of it and starting to see what sort of influence we have because those days are over where communities can just go bang on the table and say something's got to change and we've got to do something about it. So these partnerships has allowed us to bring science to the tables and allow us to do that. Um, and through all of our partnerships, whether we're working with Raincoast, and I know part of the job with Christina is to say that you have to work with our local community, to say that you have to take local community people up there and go um, and train some of our local members to make sure that you know, those skills stay there and hopefully will help inspire a new generation of scientists in our community that will get up there and do some of that research or continue that research up there. So that's been really important. But essentially, that's why we created the Spearberg Research Foundation. And, and Spearberg Research Foundation, um, again, we try to focus a bit more on holistic view of management, not just look at one particular thing. Uh, again, we want to do research on salmon, on bears, on their habitat mixture, all those are all protected. So that was really important for us. But we also want to make sure all the other pieces are fitting in there as well. Again, to make sure that the capacity is built in the communities, having young people grow up and, and, and they can get out there and do some of this work to make sure that our Coastal Guard and Washington programs are out there enforcing all of these things, and to make sure that we protect the, you know, the values uh, and protect all the, the habitat for all the bears and for hopefully all British Columbians and Canadians and a lot of people from around the world that want to come and see uh, what we have. So. 
And I guess I just want to end it, you know, my community has always said all throughout our plans, land use planning, marine use planning, whatever it is, they have always said, Doug, you know, this, if you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. And that was always really important. And um, that's something that the, the elders always stressed and it's written through our plans, it's passed on to the next young generation. And I think that's all of our responsibility. And I think it doesn't matter whether you're First Nations or non-First Nations, whether you're a scientist or not a scientist, you know, I think just the way things are going now, I just think that you know we all have to start uh, standing up and doing something. And, and you know we look forward to partnering with us uh, with scientists and, and doing some of this work. And, and again, taking that science to the government to government tables and start changing some of these policies that are out there because some of them are outdated and uh, and just need to change. So um, I think with that said, that's all I have to say. I can go on a million different subjects, but uh, maybe I'll just leave it open for any for any questions. So, thank you. Christina, where's Christina? You want to answer that question? No. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to me, uh, I think First Nations have always had the authority. I mean, especially in British Columbia, where we haven't signed treaties uh, with any government. We were never conquered in war, or, you know, uh, we never gave it away. Um, so to me, we're going to continue to enforce it. You know, obviously, we want to try and work with, uh, you know, provincial and federal governments on, on some of these issues. Um, but yeah, so we are on the government to government tables now, having a lot of discussions right now. Um, but whether they agree or not, we'll continue to enforce it on the ground, and we'll continue to be there. And, uh, I was really hoping for a trophy hunter in our territory this year, uh, just to prove a point, but it didn't quite happen. <laughs> but you know, to me, I think we've done our due diligence as a level of government. We've collected that, you know, all the science work. You know, we've done the economics, we've done 
whole of British Columbians, where 91% of people now oppose you know, these sort of practices. Um, so I, you know, I don't know where it's left to go. We'll continue to force it. And I think we're getting closer, and I think, but it's going to continue, continue to take you know, a lot of different groups, uh, you know, whether it's Raincoast or whether it's Peer Research Foundation or communities, uh, you know, just to continue to keep the pressure up in order to end these, these kind of things. So. Would you support a provincial referendum to ban trophy hunting? Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I, mean, I wish I could get up and speak for all of British Columbia when it comes to bears, but I can't because all of our research is really focused on the Great Bear. And what I hope happens is that we end trophy hunting in the Great Bear Rainforest, and then that's contagious, that other regions will start to protect it and it'll be kind of, you know, it'll, it'll be contagious. So that's what I hope happens. Um, but I think British Columbians have spoke very loud and clear. And now, you know, I know, I think there was one poll that was done in 2003 that I think at that time it was 79% of British Columbians did not support trophy hunting. And we did a poll, uh, part of our bear working group, and uh, that number had climbed to 87% uh, of people uh, didn't support it. Um, and then number now, there was a more recent poll that was done by another group that came up with 91% of people did not support it. So I think numbers are growing. And I think the issues are, are really starting to, to, you know, spread. And I think things like social media are really starting to allow people to have access in terms of reading what's going on in our backyard. Uh, and, and that's been great. The whole Cecil the Lion thing, I mean, that was huge. I mean, to watch that, that happen. So. Mm -hmm. uh, legally, according to the BC government, are black bears and spirit bears seen as identical as far as protection? No. So yeah, the question is, are black bears and white bears identical in terms of protection? No. So I call it bear racism. White bears are protected and black bears are protected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So spirit bears are protected? Spirit bears are protected, yeah. You cannot shoot or harvest any spirit bears, um, but you can harvest a black bear that's carrying that recessive gene that could produce that spirit bear. So, um, so yeah, black bears can be hunted. Okay, I think that's it. And I'll be around to take any other questions later on. And uh, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Everyone, there's just a few minutes of, uh, I guess it's kind of business. And, and, you know, I used to be kind of shy in doing this, <laughs> asking people to invest in our work, but I'm totally over that. Because, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm old now, but actually, you know, it's I, I believe in what I do. Doug believes in what he does, um, and we know we are moving the bar. Um, so now's the time of the evening where we ask you to invest in us, and because that's typically the kind of questions we get after the shows. You know, we've identified some solutions. How can we be a part of it? So I'm kind of going to lay it out for you, and it's not all about money, but we'll get to that soon. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things is, you know, really, uh, the provincial government needs to hear from you. It really does. You may wonder why, despite this incredible poll numbers, pollsters have commented that rarely, rarely, rarely do British Columbians ever agree on anything to this level. So you might wonder, why the hell is the province digging its heels in? Well, here's what's going on. There's a few ridings, particularly in the southeast of the province and the northeast of the province, where hunting is sacred where seats between the Liberals and the NDP are heavily contested and neither party dare do anything that sends a signal that they're going to be giving these urban environmentalists or First Nations, actually, uh, uh, something in the hunt. And so the argument from kind of the bad guys there, and that they're just a small, what I refer to as a fringe population of hunters, because most hunters, it's reflected in the data also at about the same 90% level, they're also opposed to trophy hunting. But that small fringe minority is using an argument that goes like this. If you let those environmentalists and or First Nations take away your grizzly bears, 
They're going to come after your elk. They're going to come after your moose and deer, etc. And nothing motivates uh, both the hunters in these areas and the politicians to do everything they can to stop this grizzly bear hunt. Uh, campaign from success. So that's where we're at, kind of a stalemate that the Liberal government and the NDP opposition dare not do anything, at least province-wide. Doug's been very modest in underplaying his nations and other nations like his ability to sit down at the table and negotiate with the province. We're now in an era where the province wants an awful lot of coastal First Nations. And I won't say any more, I won't tip uh, Doug's hat, uh, but Doug is doing a lot of heavy lifting uh, on behalf of, you know, 90% of the province. And, and that's probably how things will change in those negotiations. But you can play a part, too, by engaging. One uh, really good uh, avenue for you to do this is through the bearsforever.ca website. Uh, check it out. It's a product of the Bear Working Group. Um, uh, check out the Bear Witness, the movie. If you haven't seen that movie, um, please do that like tonight or, or tomorrow to learn more about this. Uh, also, of course, check out Spirit Bear Research Foundation or spiritbearfoundation.org and, of course, rainpost.org. And on both these sites, the first and last site, you can find out how you can contact your MLAs, the Premier, etc. Um, because, you know, it's very easy for us to sort of shake our head here and go, why is the government doing this? And then we go home and we don't pick up the phone or pick up our keyboard to tell our government, our pro provincial government anyways, that, that as a voter that you're um, adamantly opposed. So I, I encourage you to, to do that. Yes, sorry. I think it's important to say that the way that people choose to communicate is actually really important. The provincial government has, if they, for the people that work in the communications department and for the federal government, they have a, a sheet that they go by, which if you get a signature on a petition, like a handwritten signature, it's worth just many people who feel the same way. Online petitions where you sign via email, unfortunately, they help, especially when you can deliver them in large quantities, but that doesn't really catch uh, the politicians. If you send an old-fashioned letter, handwritten, with pen and ink, and you put a, no, you don't even need a stamp, you send it off to them, that, according to the provincial sheet, is worth about 400 people who feel the same way, but who have not bothered to communicate. So that's, for the scientists here, statistically significant. <laughs> Very low p-value, thank you. <laughs> that's important. Um, we're also going to ask you to invest in, 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 Doug mentioned how expensive this work is. So Doug, maybe send a couple of minutes about the remote cameras. Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if, you know, the, the remote cameras are extremely expensive. Like I said, we have well over 100 rivers, uh, so everyone want to look at supporting. The purchase of a camera, which helps us collect all that data, uh, you know, would be huge. It help us, uh, as Paper Research Foundation or Rain Coast, to be able to collect that data uh, and go and do something with it. So that would be very helpful. Um, I kind of did a back of the envelope calculation because we capture many of these animals genetically time and time again within a season and across seasons. And on average, these bears, if they're not killed early by, by humans, they can live 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Um, and so to trap something like this, maybe not on the 25 year time horizon, but the next five or 10 years, that's about how much it costs to do that. Another thing you could do is potentially uh, for a donation of, of 3000 would go towards supporting uh, a local person in the community. Uh, you know, we have students now we're hiring to really encourage them to get involved in some of the science work that we're doing and uh, that helps really keep that science in the community that we can continue these kind of projects uh, over the long term. And we've hired this lady, uh, this young lady uh, right out of school. She was uh, an intern for a bit and now she's a full-time staff member with uh, Spearberg Research Foundation. 
Um, and you know, maybe many of you, I'm, I'm just joking here, but are saving up for Black Friday and Best Buy and, and all this stuff. It's the holiday giving season. So we're basically giving you some other options to consider <laughs> for your family member. Here's the biggest one, uh, of course, and that's, that's the help of both the nations and the coast buy out a whole bunch more of these guys up and down the coast. Our intention is to knock these things down like dominoes. And, uh, it's very expensive to do so. And so, um, although only maybe a small fraction of you have the resources to, to go big to help us do this, um, sometimes some magic happens at, at uh, evenings like this. So um, we thank you for considering that um, too. We've already done uh, questions and answers. It's a tiny bit more work with our uh, raffles here. I'd like to thank everyone uh, uh, for coming, thank the sponsors of both tonight and our uh, science. Um, tonight's volunteers, some of whom are coming down right now. And uh, I think we're gonna go for it here. So grab your tickets out if you can, please. I've been told this is the Rain Coast gift bag, goodie bag, and there's some wonderful 